So now, I've raised the specter of good laboratory practice evaluations. So what does that mean in terms of a toxicology study, a GLP toxicology study? First and foremost, it has, at the end of the day, has to be approved by the Quality Assurance Unit. That's number one. Now, the description of the study. We talk about the animals themselves, duh. The species, strain, sex, age, weight. Now, this can get very complicated. We'll uh, describe the vendor, who sold them to us. Where were they bred? What are the breeding and disease records? Uh, in some of my studies, I have actually specified the room number at the CRO from which I want my animals to come from, okay? I want room 197 at your outfit in Kansas. Um, and we'll talk about the shipping condition. You know, how did they get to my facility? Um, how long were they acclimated in-house? You know, travel, as you all know, is exceedingly stressful. You get on an airplane and go to Washington. That is stress. Well, think about animals who come from Charleston to California. Same thing. They need a couple of days. They need a week to recover. Otherwise, they're, you know, they've, that affects the study if you're under stress. When we, get to, when we get them to our facility, are they still clean? Are they still bacteria-free? Are they free of disease? And we talk about randomization procedures. How do we randomize them to dose groups? And that's a complicated issue, which I won't go into. But the idea is that the animals have to be randomly distributed across the dose groups. And we describe the number of sex for each dose group. There is some statistical issue here. Um, we actually set fairly high numbers because we are determined our want at the end of the study is sufficient number of animals survived and necropsied and evaluated that we can feel statistically certain that what we see is real and not just a fluke. All right, so numbers of animals. And we describe the drug, the active pharmaceutical ingredient. This comes from the chemistry manufacturing and control group. So what batch are we using, for example? Have we got the appropriate analytical methods in place? And we need, at this stage, validated methods for the active pharmaceutical ingredient. So this CMC has to be ahead of us on having validated the means by which they identify and quantitate the active pharmaceutical ingredient. Otherwise, it's not a GLP study. Typically, a GLP study consists of dosing with controls at three to five dose levels. Uh, we discuss the root, method, etc., the frequency. How frequently is the dose form prepared? If I'm going to dose a rat orally with a liquid suspension, an aqueous suspension, uh, how frequently do I prepare that suspension? Is it weekly or is it daily? Frequently, more often than not, it's daily because I don't have any information on the stability. I don't know how long that drug will last without breaking down within that aqueous suspension. I need to be able to analyze those dose formulations. So at the end of the dosing day, I take samples of those formulations and send them off to the analytical lab where they're tested for content, the API, is it what it's supposed to be, and is the concentration what it's supposed to be? Did I mix things up uh, when it was prepared in the morning? Was it prepared the way it was supposed to be prepared? If it's supposed to have four milligrams per mil, does it have four milligrams per mil? Or, heaven help me, does it have eight milligrams per mil? These are, these are very important issues. So that's to confirm that the animals in that particular dose group did in fact receive the stated dose. And we need validated analytical methods for the API in that vehicle. Moving right along, quality assurance unit approved, slide two, the attributes of a definitive GLP toxicology study. We perform toxicokinetics, that is pharmacokinetics in the toxicology animals within that particular study. So what we're looking for here are the blood levels of the active pharmaceutical ingredient through time after dosing. It has several outcomes. First of all, it confirms the level of systemic exposure. Now for rats, we don't want to bleed rats on a regular basis, so we actually have what are called satellite groups of rats. So rats which are in separate cages, treated identically at the same time as the toxicology study animals, and those rats are bled, or mice, if that's the case, um, and that blood is sent for evaluation. But the idea here is that we dose and we watch the rise in the plasma concentration curve over time and its demise. And we're looking here for species, strain, sex, and root differences. 
So this is part of the confirmation of a toxicology study. We think about the duration and degree of systemic exposure at each dose level. We're hopefully looking for what's called dose proportionality. If I administer two milligrams per kilogram and get a certain plasma level over time, and I raise the dose to four milligrams per kilogram, I would like to see double that exposure, and so on. Frequently, the linearity falls off, sometimes relatively rapidly. It plateaus in a way. And at that stage, I don't have to increase doses much beyond that plateau. If you don't get plateauing, then you essentially have to dose, increase your dose levels up to the physical maximum. For example, you can dose a rat with a maximum of approximately 2,000 to 3,000 milligrams per kilogram per day. But at that stage, the feces become sort of chalk-like in many cases, and there's no point in going beyond that because there's no room for them to eat food. Um, so there's some scientific rationale applied to this whole process. It's not just rote. Now, these plasma or serum or blood determinations of the active pharmaceutical ingredient require fully validated bioanalytical methods. So it's not just the API in, in the barrel and the active pharmaceutical ingredient in that aqueous suspension. Now we're talking about identifying the active pharmaceutical ingredient in plasma or urine or feces or liver or any other tissue within those animals. Typically what we do is fully validate in one species and then perform a, what's called a cross-validation, less than a full validation in all other species. And the issues here are stability. If, if it's in blood, does it degrade in blood while it's sitting on the bench or on the shelf or waiting for analysis? Um, can I extract my AP out of the blood? Can I be assured that I'm getting 100% back of what's in there? And are there interfering substances? So what's the specificity of my bioanalytical method? Is, is there junk in the blood normally which would interfere with my, with my bioanalytical method? Uh, so that's sort of what involved, what's involved in, in validation. Now, in early studies, this validation process can represent 30 to 40 percent of the overall toxicology study cost. So it's not, you know, I've been through this frequently. Uh, we get one quote for the toxicology study and the histopathology and everything else, and then an entirely separate quote representing almost 50 percent more uh, for the bioanalytical methods and performing those studies. So here's an example of a typical 28-day rat study. How we have on the, oops. All right, let's talk about dose levels. Controls, there's always a control group. Sometimes there are two control groups, not often. We're talking about a low dose group, a mid dose group, a high dose group, and sometimes a high, high dose group. Uh, for a 28-day study, uh, we enter 15 males and 15 females to each dose group. You can see that this adds up through this period to 150 animals. Now, I've listed over here in this middle column, recovery groups. All right, I've initiated a study, I'm gonna dose for 28 days, and I'm gonna necropsy the main body of animals on day 28. But, I am, have some extra animals here who I'm going to let survive for another 14 or 28 days without dosing them. So this is the recovery group. And the question being asked here is, if I see effects on day 28, after 28 days of dosing, do those effects remain in the recovery groups, even though they've not seen the drug for 14 days or 28 days, or have they gone away? Can the animal recover from the effects? I need fewer animals in, in this particular group, um, but a, a number. Now remember I said rat studies or rodent studies, I generally have a satellite group. These are the animals I'm going to bleed. You can imagine you can't take, a 200 gram rat has about 10 mils of blood. If I want a one mil blood sample twice a day, I'm gonna make that rat look even paler than an albino rat normally looks. And I can't do that to my toxicology animals. You are not going to feel very well if I remove 10% of your blood volume. Just not a good thing to do. So a satellite group. Now. All right, so overall, we have 258 rats in this study. The numbers of 15 and 15 are somewhat arbitrary, but do have statistical significance. If I lost four or three or four animals inadvertently, 
during the course of the study. I, by lose, I don't mean uh, I, I lose them because they run away. I, I mean they die for some reason or another. Or, well, sometimes they do escape, you know, because we're changing cages each day, and it's quite possible for a rat to escape. Um, anyway, at the end of the study, I'm likely to have 10 or 11 animals remaining, even in the high, high dose group, so I can feel statistically confident that what I see is actually there, and it's not a fluke. If I only had one animal left and I saw something, would the other 15 animals have shown that? Or is, you know, so there's these statistical bases here. Now, I, I'm always at the mercy of my chemistry manufacturing and control callings when I do a study like this. Because if I have selected dose levels of 50, 250, 1,000, and 2,500 milligrams per kilogram, and we include a 15% overage for spillage, et cetera, and the, and the analytical, then this study requires 1.3 kilos of material. And remember, I'm performing this study very early on prior to filing the IND. So all I can say is my, I, I feel of my chemistry colleagues who have to provide me with one and a half kilos of material before we've even made the decision to go ahead and file the IND. You will find as we go through this, that this is a very